Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. Sorry, Sarah, I was uh, loading to YouTube, so I was on a different screen and didn't want to hop off of it <laughs> to unmute myself. No, that's fine. I think it was, I think Emily answered. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's, I, I asked her too. Emily is just getting us up and running on from YouTube onto the web page, and then I will call us to order. Emily, are you still cold from town meeting? Yes. <laughs> I got home and it was like, you know, when you come inside and you're not cold right away. And then like for hours, it seeps out of your bones. Yep. <laughs> it's like that. Luckily, I had a blanket from a friend that helped. Yeah. I woke up in the middle of the night absolutely freezing and had to get another blanket after that. Sorry, everyone, we're just having a little trouble getting the YouTube to line up with the um, website. So Emily's going to try it again. Okay, so we are live on YouTube, uh, which is on our website as well. And then James is recording for MHTV. Um, Sarah Gold is here, David Harris is here, Emily Barron is here, Sarah Fox is here, Megan Taylor is not with us this evening. Um, so I will now call us to order at 7.02 p.m. And first up is commendations. Uh, and we have Brian Oda here to walk us through some commendations for the Glover School. Welcome, Brian. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to talk about some of the amazing things that are happening at the Glover School right now. First, let me start with the origami grant that Tammy Nolte, our art teacher, received from the Mass Cultural Institute for $4,200 and to our Glover PTO who procured all the materials we need. The instructor, Motoko, is Zooming with the third grade students over the course of this month. Ms. Nolte is in the classroom and helps augment the lesson and most importantly, help with the folding. Every piece they create is directly tied to geometric shapes such as trapezoids, isosceles triangles, right angles, squares, and a very variety of different shapes that she uses. What is also impressive is she taught our students the word symmetry which means everything done on one side is done on the other, thus creating balance. So if you look at my little fox here, on the back side you can see every fold is duplicated in origami, thus creating balance. This is great timing because it falls just before MCAST, which does have geometry questions in it. If you would like to join these classes, I will send Sarah a link with the schedule of the different classrooms so that you can sign up and join us if you'd like. Dr. Bucky and Nan Murphy has already signed up, and as you can see from my rabbit, I have also taken the first class. 
Once again, the Glover School will be part partnering with the American Heart Association to help teach our students and families how to take care of their hearts through the Kids Heart Challenge, formerly known as Jump Rope for Heart. Through a variety of movement activities, which include but are not limited to jump rope, every one of our Glover students from pre-K to grade three will have the opportunity to participate in an event that promotes heart health, positive goal setting, and growth mindset. We are proud to announce that this will be Glover School's 12th consecutive year of participating in this challenge. And we estimate, and we average about $5,000 raised every year. So over the course of the time, we estimate we've raised over $50,000 for the American Heart Association. Typically, we do this in the month of February, which is February. However, with COVID, we are unable to do it then, so we are now doing it this month from May 17th through the 21st in our phys edu class, phys edu education classes. I want to thank Mr. Fargo for all his hard work to make this program an annual part of our Glover School. Last but not least, during the month of April, Jessica Levensey, our special education chair, Taylor Henry and Alex Miniter, our inclusion teachers and PBIS coaches, focused our social emotional learning on disability awareness. Our goal was to teach students how to be aware and accept differences in each other. We celebrated how we are different and how we are the same at the Glover School. Students and staff explored their strengths and areas of growth to promote understanding and acceptance of what makes the Glover School community so unique. We've explored differences through read-alouds, video books, class-wide activities, and videos, and we are learning to understand how to recognize the able in each student and not the label. If you'd like to see these amazing slides, I can also forward a link to Sarah so that you can take a look at them at your leisure. We also want to thank Rachel Levitt, a coffin teacher who received the grants from the Friends of Marblehead Public Schools to buy a book called Difference is Awesome for every classroom teacher and to bring the author Robert Hack, excuse me, Ryan Hack, to talk to every grade about his phys physical disability and how it has not limited or determined what his life is to be. So I want to thank you all for allowing me to take a few minutes of your time to give you all the wonderful things we've done in the last two months at Clover. Do you have any questions or? Thank you so much, Brian. That's a, such great work. Um, and we'll be sure, I'll, I'll forward those links on to Emily so we can get them up on our webpage. Um, so if anybody is looking for them. Okay, thank you. Sarah, did you have something you wanted to say? I would love both the links for what Tammy's doing as well as the disability awareness. And that, I am so happy to hear they're doing that because I've always said and, and, um, accessibility is not inclusion. And this, what they're doing is embodying the idea of true inclusion and, and um, everything that's great. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us and thank you to everybody doing it. Always a pleasure to have you, Brian. Thank you. All right, that um, moves us into school committee commendations. John, you've got one. I do. Uh, give me a minute. I'm going to be sharing screens and working off of a second screen, showing all of my tech capabilities. Um, I know that uh, Committeeman Harris mentioned this last time uh, we were here, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, Loden Rodriguez, who is joining us this evening, I promised him he would not have to sit through a, an entire school committee meeting, but he, uh, we received the press release information and I will include a link to a video in the superintendent's update tomorrow. But um, Marblehead senior Loden Rodriguez has been named Gatorade Massachusetts Cross Country Player of the Year. This is a tremendous honor for any student athlete to receive. He joined some of the country's most elite athletes in their given sport, and we could not be prouder of this recognition. Very rarely do we as school administrators get to celebrate an athletic achievement of this magnitude. I hope we can all appreciate the hard work Loden has put in up to this point, and we know he will continue to make us proud when he goes to the University of Massachusetts next fall. Loden, you've brought great joy and pride to Coach Brian Heenan and the whole Marblehead community. Please join me in congratulating Loden on this incredible achievement. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Awesome. It's great. Loden, welcome to our meeting. Thanks for coming. I think it was a little short notice, but we appreciate that you that you came on tonight and, and joined us. So congratulations. It's just, it's an amazing honor. We, you know, we're Marblehead is beaming with pride. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. And best of luck next year and in all of your endeavors. And I'm sure that, you know, it sounds like you'll go on to UMass and, and do great things for them as well. Thank best you. of luck. Thank you again. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Okay. Um, and I think John has a video that he shared a little bit, um, but we couldn't get his sound to work correctly. We were troubleshooting some of it before the meeting. Um, so he's going to put it in his weekly update, correct? So the link to that video um, that, that, that he referenced and had shared on the screen. Anybody else have any commendations? Sarah? I just wanted to take the opportunity um, to recognize our teachers uh, all of our staff and our, and our nurses also, because it's nurses, nurse appreciation day. Um, it's the daughter of nurses and sister of nurses. I'd get slaughtered if I didn't do that too. Um, but really this year has been, you know, an unbelievable hurdle for everyone, but our, our staff has showed up with a smile, no matter what's going on, no matter the stress behind the scenes or how much harder it's been, they, they show up and they show calm waters to our kids and all my kids are remote, so I get to see a lot more of what's going on than I've ever seen before. And the level of patience that our, our, all of our staff has, I have absolutely no idea where they draw this all from because there's days like I have an ulcer just watching it. Um, and they're, they're amazing. They're, they're absolutely amazing for everything they give to our students and our kids. And I just wanted to recognize them and tell them from the bottom of my heart how much I appreciate what they all do. You're here. Well said, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, I second everything that she said, and you know we're we're very 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 lucky um, to have the levels of professionalism that we have in this district. And uh, yeah, we we appreciate every one of them. John, did you have something else? Yeah, I'll just piggyback on what uh, Sarah said. Today is National Nurses Day, but next week is uh, School Nurses Day. So we have two weeks uh, to celebrate them. And I think that there's no better year for us to recognize our nurses with two weeks of honor, acknowledgement and celebration. So today is National Nurses Day and next week is School Nurses Day. Absolutely agreed. Uh, does anybody else have any other commendations? All right, uh, that will move us on to our student representative, Dan Howells. Dan, welcome. Hi. Um, so since uh, the last time uh, we are back in school um, and back in school full time. So we had our first full day of school in over a year, um, which is hard to believe. And after talking to some students, uh, you know, it's almost hard to believe that we used to do this. You know, we used to be at school for so many hours at a time. Uh, there's definitely been an adjustment period, um, but we're all getting back into the swing of things. Um, uh, in addition, uh, the mentor program hosted a meeting for freshmen to uh, help them learn the schedule, uh, particularly with the lunches. Uh, the lunch uh, system at the high school with the three different lunch periods was possibly a little bit confusing, so there was a meeting to help uh, clear some of those questions up. Um, teachers have been extra diligent about cleaning uh, to make sure that uh, you know everything is safe. Uh, and everyone feels comfortable in the classroom because that is very important. Um, the football team had a big win against Swampscott to finish uh, their great 7-0 and season. Um, it's always great to uh, beat Swampscott and uh, everyone was really uh, proud of the team and happy about that. Uh, I also wanted to mention Loden, uh, also from the senior class, uh, who was named Gatorade's Massachusetts Cross Country Athlete of the Year. Um, uh, so I'm just super happy that he was able to get the recognition that he deserves. He's been a great runner all four years of high school um, and, you know, senior year with athletics. There's, uh, you know, a lot of kids are playing varsity and you have the big championships. You know, that's something that people look forward to. And we didn't get a lot of that, but uh, we did get this. And I'm glad that Loden uh, was able to get the recognition he deserves. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Uh, May 14th is the cultural feast, um, a chance, which is a chance for students and community members to share their culture through music, dancing, and of course, food. Um, so that will be uh, next week. Um, over this week and next week, AP exams have been taking place for, uh, I believe, mainly juniors and seniors. Um, so uh, possibly stressful time, but uh, excited to get them uh, done. Um, and we have been working on our senior events. So our senior week is going to be uh, more dense than usual uh, as uh, to, uh, to adhere to DESI guidelines and things like that, we're limiting the number of events and combining aspects of different events uh, into uh, just a few. So the last three days before our graduation will be um, our prom event, uh, our senior show event, and, um, and then graduation. So there was a meeting earlier tonight, actually, uh, outlining how those nights will go uh, in terms of the uh, just logistics and, and safety and things like that. Um, so we're very excited about the events. And though, uh, you know, they're not the, our typical events, we're, we're really excited about them. And I think we're, uh, you know, getting as much of the normal events as we can. So I, I'm very pleased and I hope everyone will have a good time when they come up. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dan. It's great yeah. to hear the update on all of that stuff. There's been a lot that's been going on and it's all very exciting. And I think we're going to hear from uh, Principal Bauer in a little while to give further updates on all of those great senior week activities and everything that's being worked out. So it's great to hear it from your perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in a couple <laughs> of weeks. Yes. All right, that leads us to public comment. Um, if anyone wants to raise their hand to make a public comment this night, uh, tonight, you may do so. And I will call upon you. All right, I'm not seeing anybody's hand at this point in time. Um, so I will move us along to the superintendent's report. John? Yes, I have. Uh several people that will join me uh, for the superintendent's update, but I just wanted to give a quick update on the planning for success initiative um, that's proceeding very, very nicely. And it's probably no surprise that we have had my favorite word robust interest in people participating, which is wonderful. Um, students have reached out to me and staff and uh, community members. I'm pleased to report Jason Silva has agreed to join. Uh, us. Uh, so the town representative that people asked for uh, last week, we were able to do that. Um, I was able to address concerns about the times uh, that they would not all be 9 to 1130 in the morning. We were able to change 50% of the time. So two of the four meetings will be 3 to 530 in the afternoon. So um, the facilitator was pretty um, she, ha she has been doing some uh, planning for success initiatives in other districts that put it on hold when COVID hit because of not being able to do it in person. So she and I both agree that we really would want this initiative to be done in person. And so that really is the only piece that I'm not able to update from the committee's request from last week. All right, thanks for that update. And that'll come up later yeah. in the meeting as well. We have it under the, the school committee piece um, so that we can talk about it and, and choose who the two representatives will be for us. Okay. John, do you want to just update on the inside outside discussion we had? Sure. Um, okay. Sarah called me earlier the, uh, this afternoon and asked if we could do the in person outside, which I thought was a great. Uh, suggestion because we've invested in these tents and we have them on property. So if people, weather is permitting, uh, we do have to have access to technology. I didn't reach out to the facilitator. I didn't have time. I don't imagine that she would have a concern with that, but we do need to have access to technology, but I'm sure Stephen Quietech can get us some, uh, maybe one of the rolling smart boards um, that we've invested in and be able to do this outside. So people that have concerns about the in-person piece indoors, we could accommodate that. So does that capture it, sir? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, John. 
Continue on. Yes, I, I believe Mr. Bauer is up next for uh, updating us on senior activities. And uh, Dan Howes did a really nice job of teeing it up for Mr. Bauer. So I'll let him take it away and update the committee on a meeting that just, I think, ended moments ago. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bucky and school committee. I'm sorry. Um, we're finalizing AP testing for tomorrow. So <laughs> Ms. Uh, Susan Schaffer has really stepped up to help us uh, make this a reality. So we're grateful for her helping us and thank goodness. Um, before I begin, I did see Loden in his AP test today. So just to tell you, not only is he a great athlete, but he's a great student and also a great citizen in our school. So it's uh, wonderful to report that out. Um, yeah, so I'm here for the graduation component and I can speak a little bit about some of the uh, activities, but we did receive updated DESE guidelines on April 28th in terms of graduation. Um, there are some subtle changes, but I'll just give the highlight points because I will send out communication to families. And we did speak about, this was spoken about tonight at the, um, the senior class meeting. The big news is the date, which is Friday, June 4th at 6 p.m. It'll be held on Piper Field and it will be an outdoor ceremony. Um, we will not have an indoor rain plan. So our rain dates are Saturday, June 5th at 2 p.m. And if we have a lot of rain, then we'll go Sunday at 2 p.m. on June 6th. Um, we're very excited about it. I think the big news is that we've done this outdoor ceremony before, so we have the blueprint. Uh, and so the last time we did this, it was extremely successful. It was one of the best ceremonies, obviously I'm biased, that I've been around. Uh, we know some of the points that we need to expand to meet the DESE guidelines. So the most important piece about this is capacity and being able to space out at the maximum distance. So we're going to utilize Piper Field as much as possible and be able to put seats in pods for family members. At this time, uh, we are, we're working with four tickets per family, but we still are working on maximizing the capacity. So we'll do the best that we can. We'll have a final count. But as of this point, it's four tickets per, per family. So we'll space the chairs together on Piper Field of, um, and pods of four chairs, and they will be six feet apart. So we'll maximize that piece. The other piece that's really important is that we have to have a, a, an advanced sign up for this because we need to know basically who is here. So we'll be sending out a Google form for that that can record uh, the family members that will be in attendance. Uh, and that's very important. The other part is arriving at the ceremony, we have to do a staggered arrival for uh, family members. We just can't have everybody meeting all together. So we have to space that out. So we're working on a way that we can be equitable in terms of the spacing uh, to ensure uh, that we do the best that we can for seating and bring forth the parents and family members in a, an orderly manner. We'll probably have multiple entrances to Piper Field to seat the families. Um, and then from that point, it will be the typical, as typical can be ceremony, where we'll, we'll bring the senior class in, we'll seat the senior class. Um, we'll have the speakers that go through. The important point is on the stage, really will just be the person speaking. The microphone will be wiped down uh, after every speaker. Uh, when we bring the students up for their diplomas, we do have to sit down on the table where they'll pick it up and cross over. So that's one minor piece. We'll have the students that will have gloves and put it in the right place. Uh, and Sarah, we'll work on having you position there as you typically give the diplomas out. We'll have a spot off the side of the stage where we can take a picture where the student can unmask for that. So we have a safe spot for that, which is important. As we said, there will be music. We have provisions for that with the spacing. Uh, I spoke with Mr. Scolio and Mr. Gadu, and they understand the spacing that's required for the uh, band, as well as the acapella singers. We have a professional sound system that will be here that will uh, be on site early enough to make sure mic up, they have a sound check in advance to make sure that they can maximize the sound as well. Um, the last part is really leaving we have to leave in an orderly fashion because typically everybody joins in the field and they go crazy, which is, you know, which is typical, but we can't do that. So we'll have to exit the seniors out in an orderly manner and work the best that we can and stagger that as best we can. So I think that will all be great. It'll be a classy ceremony that we always take great pride in this community um, to help with safety guidelines, the cap and gowns, the students will keep them. So they're not returning them. 
we have a, a tote bag for all seniors that the night before is the senior show where we'll distribute them, where the cap and gown will be inside. Also graduation programs, we'll put six of those in the bag along with the tickets. So that way when the student gets home, they can distribute those programs and tickets to their family members as well. We just can't pass out the programs on site, unfortunately. Uh, in terms of Piper Fuel rules, it matches the guidelines well. There's no water at the ceremony or food, which are Piper Fuel rules anyway. And for those on the field, we have to make sure that uh, flat soled shoes uh, to protect the turf uh, and make sure we take good care of the field. So those are the big keys and the big um, going away uh, for that. And we're very excited. And as, as Dan said, um, it'll be nice to be out and, and have a great night. So I'm not gonna jinx us with AccuWeather, weather, although I'm checking for June 4th, but I won't say anything publicly on that. Um, if you just a quick recap on the uh, senior class, um, the senior the senior formal event that will take place um, in advance on Wednesday evening will be wonderful. And we'll have all the elements of a typical prom as best we can. And the goalposts have moved so much throughout this. Um, we're, just, we're just ecstatic that we can offer the different components. Assistant Principal Lindsay Page has been working with our class advisors as well as the student class officers. Um, they did a survey last weekend to put together what they felt would be the best plan. But with the new guidelines changing, they can actually dance, which I'm just shocked and we're thrilled that they can have that. They'll have the red carpet. And one item that I don't think was promoted as much in the meeting just because of covering information is we will allow family members and parents to be here to witness the red carpet, although we'll use the stadium and the field to space that out. Um, we weren't sure we could do that. We thought we'd have to stream the event, um, but we'll have that live, which is great. They'll have a box dinner. Uh, they'll mix the awards in there, but it won't be the awards that'll take a long time because we really want the students to be able to socialize and enjoy themselves. So Ms. Page is working on condensing the awards to make sure they're, they're meaningful. The students wanted them that night because the next night will be the hypnotist as well as the senior show. So they really want the focus of that this, that next night. Um, so the dancing will be here, the DJ. I know uh, Ms. Murphy will be here as well. She said she'll join us um, as well, just teasing. And then on the next night on Thursday will be the senior show and hypnotist. They wanted the hypnotist, which they'll have at the PAC. There's plenty of space, social distancing. We work with the Board of Health to review this as well as Mr. Bloodgood. And then afterwards is the senior show, which uh, is a big highlight for, for the seniors. Friday morning at 9 a.m. will be graduation rehearsal here at the high school. Uh, that's mandatory. And the students will all wear their shirts or, or sweatshirts with whatever college or wherever they go, military uh, or whatever their future plans are. Um, they'll go through the rehearsal, then they'll go home and come back. So. We're, we're pleased that we're able to offer it. And certainly the timing is everything by moving the prom or the, excuse me, the senior formal event, the Wednesday, we actually got, we worked around. They changed the, the, the playing field in terms of the amount of people that could be here on site. So that's wonderful. So hats off to, again, uh, Lindsay and the senior advisors, the students for planning this out and working off multiple guidelines. Uh, but we're very excited about that. And yeah, I do and have to say, Graduation will be streamed. I'm sorry, I meant to add that. It'll be streamed so that people can, if they're not able to attend, they can see it across the country. Fantastic. This is just an incredible amount of work and it's clear in all the updates and just, you know, thank you so much to you and your team. Thank you. And I have to include Michelle Carlson because she's doing the actual graduation ceremony. So it's a real team effort. Dan, I think this means so much to not just the kids, but their, their parents too. And this was no small feat. It's really impressive. Do you need our signatures in person this year, like previous or no? So we're working on that right now. Uh, Vicki Morenci, our assistant, uh, she's spearheading the diplomas. So she's organizing that. We'll need the signatures. We'll figure out a way to get them over to Widger Road. So they'll be signed. Um, okay. Yep. All right. So Sarah, you'll, you'll coordinate that with me? Yep. All right. Sounds good. Absolutely. We have the same signature anyway. So like... <laughs> It doesn't really matter. A messy Sarah with a short last name. <laughs> we literally have the same signature. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dan. John? So we have athletics update. I just, um, speaking of things changing, um, I wanted Mr. Siglarski to weigh in on our, what is now fourth season of play. 
uh, which started uh, last week and ju just provide some updates and um, have a conversation about pool testing as well. So, Greg? Thanks, everybody. That's a tough fact to follow, there, Mr. Bauer. It was heavy <laughs> stuff. Uh, all right, I just want to give a quick update on uh, the fall two season, which we just completed uh, a week and a half ago. Um, just a quick update on how the teams did. Um, it was one of the more interesting and exciting seasons I've had uh, during my tenure as, as the AD here. Uh, we were playing football in February, running indoor track outside, cheerleading for a team we couldn't even share the same field as, and playing volleyball in a field house with only two fans for the home team. With all that said, uh, our student athletes and coaches did an outstanding job with the modifications, rule changes, uh, and everything else that came with the sports they've been waiting to play since last August. Uh, between our coaches, our athletic training staff, athletic department staff, and administrative team, we were able to yet again play through the season without having any COVID shutdowns, which is uh, outstanding. We had over 220 student athletes competing on four different programs. Uh, they worked hard, they were very competitive and continued to improve in their respective sports uh, and all should be very proud of, of their efforts. Uh, our volleyball team went six and six and had another great season. Um, one of the big highlights was beating the annual powerhouse Masco uh, at Masco three to two after they beat us three nothing earlier in the season. Uh, I know Coach Miller was very excited about the turnout that she had and is excited to get back after it in just a few months. The football team went seven and zero. Oh. like Dan had mentioned, we had a, a, a great season. Um, not only did they finish undefeated, but uh, the amount of players that were able to get on and off the field for meaningful minutes was great. Uh, the boys had a great payback win versus Danvers, who beat us late last year in a tight game. Uh, and obviously, like Dan said, again, we, we beat Swamp Scott, but I can repeat that. That's fine. <laughs> great job by the whole, the whole program there. Uh, our boys track team went 4-0. Uh, it was another great season for them. Uh, they took down Beverly, Peabody, Masco, and Danvers, and going undefeated against kind of the iron of the NEC uh, for track is no small task for them. Uh, I know Coach Raymond was very happy with the progress they made as well uh, and is excited to get uh, a lot of the same faces back going again this spring season. Uh, the girls' track, uh, they went 0-4, but uh, they still had success, even though the record may not reflect it. Uh, they had some tight meets with Danvers and Masco, uh, who are predominantly very tough opponents. And I know Coach Thibault is also excited, the progress the girls made, and uh, is ready to get going for the first outdoor meet next Wednesday versus Swamp Scott. The cheer team uh, also had a great season, uh, even though it was like a year like none other. They had a, a tremendous amount of growth. The girls worked hard each week uh, and even brought in an outside coach to help with additional training. Uh, I know they're excited to get back after it again this summer as well uh, and are hoping to be back on the field, actually on the field next fall. Uh, and as usual, I need to give a quick shout out to the athletic department staff and also those who helped with game day management. All of your efforts don't go unnoticed, and I'm very grateful to be surrounded by such a talented and hardworking group. This spring, uh, like Dr. Bucky said, we started last Monday. Uh, everybody's up and running. Uh, we're excited to have another group of student athletes to shine in their respective sports. We have 367 student athletes registered this spring uh, and just had our first day of games today. Baseball had a tight one with Swamp Scott, but uh, lost 4-3 about 20 minutes ago. Uh, both boys and girls tennis played Masco. Uh, as of before I came on, the girls are still deadlocked at 2-2 with Masco with the third game on the line, and I haven't heard how boys tennis has done so far. I left about 6.30, but they were still playing when I left. So all is good. I'm really, really happy with the, with the progress our kids have made, uh, our coaches have made, and yeah, I'm, I'm I'm thrilled we're still playing. And I know that this, this group, especially the spring group who missed out entirely last spring uh, is really excited to be playing right now. So thanks for giving me the time to, to update you guys. Thanks, Greg. Um, you know, and thank you for all your hard work on that. And, um, you know, I'll throw in a little note about the fact that you guys are pulling off track at the vets as well. Um, giving those kids a little something to do after school, which is yeah. wonderful. Um, so it's just, you know, it's, it's the, again, so much hard work that goes into this. And I think, you know, just very, very worth it when we see all these successes and, and pulling off successful seasons. Right. And if you have time on Tuesday, May 25th, you may want to tune into the uh, annual Potter Puff game. We got 81 girls signed up, ready to go for Swamp Scott on a Tuesday night. That'll be fun. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, did you, did you want to give us a little update on the pool testing piece? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I, I spoke with a, a number of uh, athletic directors in our league. 
Uh, I know that uh, Salem is still uh, mandating their roughly 200 or so student athletes. They do it every week. Uh, I know their AD presented to their school committee and superintendent. He was hoping to do it just for wrestling since they're inside um, and not other sports, but that was kind of shot down by their administration. Uh, Gloucester is pool testing, but it's entirely optional whether you're an athlete or not. Uh, as of this morning, Saugus was still in the kind of the planning stages, uh, as their athletic director put it. Uh, she was in favor of it, but no policy has been set over there yet. Uh, Danvers was rumored to be doing it, but uh, they already confirmed they were not doing it this morning. And that's, that's all that is, is really doing it, at least in our league. So I think it's important to note for everybody that, um, you know, we did take a vote on this for the fall two sports. Um, but at, since then, the DESE has come back saying that they really would prefer districts not to be mandating pool testing at any level. Um, so this is kind of where this conversation has sort of gathered and wh why we wanted to bring it to the full committee this evening to discuss um, kind of, you know, which way Marblehead wanted to go. So again, um, it's, it's entirely possible to do uh, if, if that's the way we want to go down, we can, we can organize it and, and execute it like we did in the fall too, but uh, I'll kind of let you guys chat and make a call. Thanks, Greg. Um, thoughts? Greg, thanks. Thanks for the update. And uh, it was a beautiful day down at Seaside. Good. Thanks for being there and um, seeing things through and the field looks great. So thanks to Park and Rec for all that they did to get that field ready for uh, playing baseball. And, um, you know, it's great to be back, as you say, the, as the kids missed out last year. I did also see, you know, for the record, it's worth noting that Swamp Scott is just simply using a uh, self-attestation. So the athletes, uh, the memo that I saw, the athletes just, you know, attest that they, you know, are not sick, haven't had a temperature and haven't been in contact with anybody that has COVID. And that is pretty much how um, they're handling it, you know, from, from an athletic standpoint for all of their teams. And it was fairly well outlined. And I think given, you know, what we know now versus what we knew, um, earlier in the year. And I think as we've progressed through and, um, they're actually allowing spectators at events and vaccinations have been progressing as they have been. I certainly, and I understand that we're still going to have the voluntary pooled testing that people can participate in. And I think we saw a very, as you know, very successful pooled testing in the last, uh, you know, six weeks and um, pretty much didn't have any major impacts on any of the teams. Right, Greg? Is that true? A true statement? It's correct. Yeah. We didn't have any positive. Right. Pool tests. So, you know, I'd, I'd be in favor of, and given that everybody's pretty much outdoors, um, I think I'm okay moving, moving forward with that in, in the spring. So Greg, wrestling's happening in the sp spring, right? It does. Yeah. We're actually there. They have, uh, seven meets. We're going to try to get one actually outside under the lights one night, which okay. would be cool. but, the uh, majority of them are indoors. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what other schools are doing that we really just finalized a schedule this literally this morning. Um, I don't know some of the locations, um, but wherever we are, uh, especially in our field house, all the doors are open. The big garage doors open, windows are open. Uh, there's a ton of ventilation in there and we're still going to limit it. Uh, for inside spectators like we did with okay. volleyball to, to two per athlete. Now, admittedly, I've never been to a wrestling match, so I could be completely wrong in my understanding of it. Um, but th there's no such thing as, I mean, they're as close as close can be. Like out of every sport we play, that is the most in your face, correct? Uh, absolutely, yes. And that's the most likely to have like this mask shifting as they I mean, I'm late basing this on like, I'm embarrassed, but like the, what I've seen on TV, which is not, I know what you're doing, yeah, but, um, but like, that's the most likely to displace masks and, and to literally be right in each other's face, like face to face. Yes. I, I think that it would be prudent to at least keep it for wrestling since it's indoors and it seems to be of every activity we do the entire year, the highest risk for any type of transmission. 
um, if there was a case on the team, I can't imagine it wouldn't spread like wildfire. Um, that. Interestingly enough, we do, we do co-op as well with this kind of like girls hockey, we co-op with Swamp Scott in this. So there are mm -hmm. two different uh, towns. And Swamp Scott is not doing it. I don't, they, she said, she didn't say anything this morning. So as of this morning, no, they're not. Okay. And was our, cause we had none this season, but the winter season, our biggest issue with transmission was on the co-op teams. Am I correct? Not uh, trans, that, that was that was one of the teams positive. that was one of the teams. Uh, yes, one of the teams okay. that had had an issue was a call okay. team. Okay, um, so I just want to like, in my opinion, that's the riskiest one. The outdoor ones, I think, you know, are are much less risky, especially you know things like track and baseball where there's not a ton of contact. But I mean, these kids are rolling around on each other indoors, so. Through the chair. Yeah, John. So um, I'll weigh in with a recommendation. Um, I think Greg and Amanda Rivers set up a really nice program and dovetailing off what David said, um, we know more now. I would not advise the committee to take a vote to mandate it, but that we strongly encourage um, our uh, spring athletes to participate. Greg can identify the teams and when they participate and put that schedule together, but not require anyone that does not want to participate. And I, I think that it is prudent for us to do the pool testing. And we have an entire season of demonstrating that it was effective in keeping things up and running and keeping us informed. And there weren't any positives that shut down uh, a sport or a season. So, but I, I would not advise the committee to take a vote to mandate it, but to strongly encourage it. Yeah, Emily. So when you say um, strongly in, encourage, would that mean that each sport would still have like a designated time that they would? Okay. Okay. I can I can set up a whole schedule right pre practice or before they go to a game, just like I did uh, the last season. And and Greg, everything is mandated with masks. And and Sarah, I, I obviously I, I get what you're saying that that wrestling does seem like the one that masks are going to come off um, easiest on. And there was a while there where I think they were saying wrestling shouldn't have masks, um, but that that's changed. So there, they are, everything is still masked, correct? Yeah. And we're, we're still checking in every single kid, taking their temperature every day, uh, still doing the attestation every day for them and, and documenting all of that. So it's not like they're just kind of showing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And, and I'm assuming that in between matches that um that there or i don't know what the correct word is because i don't really know um wrestling either but in between each when each pair competes against each other that the mats are wiped down yeah we we have a whole spray that would be yeah. that would they would it's the same disinfectant we use all over school for doorknobs yeah. for uh high touch surfaces all that so and there, there are rules in place too that that you know minimize contact as much as you can when you're not actually like you can't even shake a kid's hand when you're done wrestling him or her so right right so that's kind of where i'm thinking deanna i see your hand is raised and i'll, I'll um let you talk it in just seems a absolutely second. bizarre i have to say <laughs> i mean you can pin them to the ground but you can't shake their hands right um that it does seem like although i don't necessarily disagree with sarah in that it, it certainly seems like the riskiest sport it just when you back up for a second and you think about the fact that it's just two people at one time and then and then as soon as they're off the mat they do have their masks back on and would be distanced from each other um that it starts to sort of you know uh, again i think it would be great if everybody participated in the pool testing for sure um but then the mandating piece especially with Desi, desi's recommendation to not do that i tend to to agree with john and david that you know we kind of that we don't mandate it this time around um, Deanna, did you want to weigh in? Go ahead. I'm just wondering, since we have Bionex now, which is the antigen test that the pH says that we can take as a true, uh, it's not a PCR, but we can take it as a true result for traveling. We can take it as a true result for if people are quarantining. 
couldn't we utilize the Bionex Now test that we have just for the kids that are wrestling? That's a 15 minute test. Now, I don't know the, the semantics of what it is to go to a wrestling meet, but couldn't we test the kids, you know, prior to the wrestling meet starting? And then with the Bionex Now, if they were negative, we would know that we're probably 99% sure that they're not positive at the time that they're wrestling. We have and that. that. And that that would be um, voluntary as well, but an, but an option that would be a much faster way to, to, it'd be a safe option for kids to know that, that they wrestling at the time that they wrestle were not contagious for COVID-19 at that time. Yes. It, I don't know if it makes a difference or not. The, the matches themselves are maximum of six minutes. If that means anything. Uh, Does anyone is... have more than one match in the same day? But I don't know how it works either. So it's like, do I have one match? And if I win, do I have another match later? No, you play one okay. match and that's it. It goes by weight. So if uh, there are two kids who are 150 pounds, they wrestle each other and then they're done. Okay. So, I mean, uh, I just, if we could look at maybe using the Bionex now, we do have it. I, I don't see why we wouldn't want to talk about using it. And again, yes, Sarah, it could be something that people just volunteer to do. But I mean, I think my kid or myself, if I was a kid, I'd be like, yeah, I want to know. So mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. the tools. I don't see why we don't use it, but certainly it's a discussion you guys can have elsewhere. It's just a thought. No, I think they that's do, a great thought. They do stop the match if a mask comes off. Too. Just, I just want to be sure that we're clear. I just want to give you everything before you make a decision. Okay. Um, I mean, it sounds like we're not going, it, it doesn't sound like there's a will here to, to mandate it, but um, I do want to be cognizant that we literally just got kids back in school full time. Like it hasn't even been a full two weeks and we've done really, really good with the pool testing. And I would absolutely hate to have that put jeopardized at all. Um, that being said, just procedurally, I don't. I thought the vote we took was not for winter sports. It was for this year. I think you're correct. So I do think we'd probably need to take a vote to basically. So I, I I'll, I'll ask. Um, so I think we'd need a motion to no longer mandate pool testing, but that it is strongly advised. Um, within the district. So because we voted on it, we would need a motion to amend the previously passed motion by someone who voted in the prevailing party, which I believe was unanimous. Agreed. But that's the procedure to it. It's a, not a new motion. It's to amend the, pa the past motion. No, I mean, we can make a new, we can make a new policy. We, we've taken a, we've taken one vote and we can take a new policy. And change it. I don't, we don't need to necessarily, I mean, I don't, it's all semantics, Sarah, however you want to do it. You can, I can make a motion to amend the vote of mandated pool testing for all athletes. Okay. And do we, we need it tonight? There wasn't, there wasn't a vote listed on here. And I know in the past we haven't wanted to do that, but. I think we try our best to list where there's going to be a vote. Um, I don't, it's not, it certainly isn't necessary. Um, you know, I think we'll, we'll continue to attempt to give those head, that heads up on the agenda so that the agenda has as much info as possible to give to people. But I don't think, you know, there are some committees that don't, don't call votes on their agenda at all. Um, so I think, I think we're okay to take the vote this evening, you know, cause the pool testing piece and with athletics was, was specifically stated, um, on the agenda. So David's got a motion that he made to amend the previous vote for mandating pool testing for athletics. Does anyone want to second it? I'll second. Okay. Thanks, Emily. Um, any further discussion on it? Go ahead, Emily. Um, so I like the idea of doing the Bionex now before a meet or however we want to integrate that into the pool testing of the wrestlers if they want to do it. Cause I think it's a great opportunity for them to know for us. To, I think it just is another safeguard that we should, I don't know how, if we say just wrestling or I don't know how we do that, but I think that we should really look into that. That's my yeah. I'd like to, I have to say, I, I, I kind of feel somewhat strongly about the wrestling piece just because of the, I mean, they're so, so close. 
Um, so I, I do feel somewhat strongly about the wrestling piece. Craig, go ahead. To recommend it, we're not going to. Just one quick point on that, Sarah Fox. Um, the reason they waited to put all the guidelines out for wrestling is they wanted to give football a couple of weeks uh, to actually go and see if anything happened with that because they they are also you know very close to each other, face to face, tackling one another. I, I I know it is a different sport, uh, but that was the reason why we got our guidelines just now versus. Uh, the additional of the other spring sports that we had a couple weeks back. So just want to put that out there as well, that they, they actually did wait for some actual um, information and, and research. So I think this sounds like, so we've got a, a motion and seconded um, to amend that previous decision. Um, I think the buy next now makes a lot of sense. And, and I don't think we're, you know, someone feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we're going to mandate by an X now. I think it's very similar to the pool testing that we're going to strongly recommend that students in wrestling take advantage of the by an X now. And I think Greg, um, you know, it, that seems, and John, correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like that, that kind of goes to you so that you can work with your athletes um, on who would like to participate in that. And then how you're going to be able to do that um, and, and, and that you would take that from the, from this point forward. That is correct. Okay. And Greg, that's something that you would would you know working with Deanna would be able to do. If that's just a, a rapid test, there's no onboarding, there's no testing that gets sent out. I can I can handle that absolutely. All right, great, great. Okay, so anybody else have anything else they would like to say? Okay. Um, so we, we have the motion. Um, I will call for a roll call. Sarah Gold, yes. Emily Barron? Yes. Uh, Sarah Fox? Abstain. And David Harris? Yes. Okay, so that motion passes uh, three to zero to one. Um, thanks. And, and again, I think it's just really important to note that that the pool test or the buy next now are very, very easy, um, very non-invasive. It's not the sort of the really deep, um, well, I can't speak for the buy next, but I know the pool testing is not that really deep swab up the nose. Um, and that, you know, we'd really encourage just everybody who, who can to, to take part in those programs because they are just an additional layer of safety, um, you know, in, in everything we do. Um, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Deanna. And I won't steal John's thunder, but I think, Deanna, you can stick around. <laughs> you guys have been, I don't know, very nice or sympathetic. Deanna was actually first <laughs> on the agenda, and I've gone horribly out of order. And so even on National Nurses Day, I hold her to a school committee meeting. So some gift. Deanna, um, I just uh, invited, it's been such a resource at the reopening committee in updating us on um, what Mr. Bauer calls the moving goalposts. And so I thought it would be helpful for the committee just to hear from Deanna some of the things that have changed, particularly with regard to mask policy. So Deanna. And I really don't mind being here because all this great news is coming from high school. And I, I, I love all the schools, but high school is my home. So I was very happy to hear all the news. So please, no worries that I waited a little while there. Um, so what, I, what I'm really mostly here for is that Desi started uh, or, or came up with a new, it's called the three to six foot mast exposure quarantine exemption. Um, it's a new exemption so that if people are within three to six feet of each other, they are still identified as close contacts, but they're not required to quarantine. So I just wanted to go over that, see if you had any questions about it, anyone on the committee, um, and just to bring it to light, because it is also another thing that's changing in the moving goalpost. Um, so I believe that you have seen the document because Lisa uh, did, did distribute it. But basically, so to start, the, the definition of close contact has not changed. It still is when you are closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes in a cumulative 15 minutes in 24 hours. But the three, to, the three to six foot mast exposure quarantine exemption is guidance for classroom settings and the bus ride to and from school. Um, in both case, and if, the both, if both case and contact are masked and exposed within three to six feet during class time, or on the bus to or from school, the exposed individuals is still a close contact that does not need to quarantine. If one person is masked and the other is not, they do need to quarantine. Only buses to and from home to school are eligible for the exemption. 
Buses to sporting events and team outings, et cetera, would not fall under this exemption. Uh, in those bus situations, we do have new bus guidance that I just found out about in the past 24 hours that we do seat kids in the seats on the buses. Um, but still, people should know that if a positive person were to have ridden the bus, we would still be doing some contact tracing. There would still be some people that closer than three feet would, would be considered needing to quarantine. People that fall within three to six feet of that child on the bus would be in this quarantine that they're notified that they're a close contact, but they don't need to quarantine. And then anyone on the bus outside of the six feet would not need to quarantine and would not be considered close contact. So it gets a little dicey, but I do, I do understand what it is. Um, another uh, only standard in school class time. So co-curriculars in the classroom setting are not eligible for this exemption. So if there's clubs going on in school, if we're talking about debate team, uh, those things would not fall under this exemption. You're only in the three to six foot mass exposure quarantine exemption if you're in class time specific. Uh, we would use standard regular close contact for any of those activities, clubs, debates. Uh, it also is not an exemption that's considered when we're at lunch or at recess. Lunch should never be a problem because we're seating kids at six feet. So uh, we do talk to kids when we're doing close contact tracing. We do talk to kids about lunch, especially I'm talking more about the high school kids because the younger grades are in more controlled lunchroom. We have lunch all over the campus when we're talking about the high school. We do like the kids to stay at six feet, but I myself walk through the cafeteria and have to remind kids to spread out a little bit. Um, all close contacts will be notified that they are a close contact, whether they're in exemption or not, because we do still have to notify people. However, they will not be told, they will be told that they do not need to quarantine unless they become symptomatic. Close contacts will be encouraged to get a PCR test five days after their last exposure and encouraged to remain home until that PCR test result comes back. Meaning if you fall into the three to six foot exposure, you will still be able to go to school. But on that fifth day after exposure, we encourage families to still have their child tested with a PCR test. If you're waiting that 24 hours for that PCR test, we would like people to stay at home because then they know that they're definitely negative. But again, it's just encouragement, it's not required. Uh, the local board of health will be notified of anyone in the three to six foot mask exposure exemption because we have to put those as close contacts in the computer. They still need to be documented and tracked because we're looking to just make sure that people fall into the three to six foot mask exposure exemption, do not return as positives down the line. Um, in my notes, this quarantine exemption can be applied to close contacts, school and personal activities. In other words, if they meet the exemption, they may attend school and also do not need to quarantine while outside of school. They'll be required to quarantine uh, they will not be required to quarantine for all for the specific three to six foot exposure, except for if they become symptomatic. The quarantine exemption does not apply in non-class school settings or if either individual is unmasked or the setting in other settings at this time. This would not apply to lunch and recess. Um, I'm sorry because my eyes, my glasses are not great, so I can't read that very clearly, but if anyone has any questions about it, please ask me and I will let you know. Uh, John, did you wanna say something? Yes, through the chair. Just if you're sitting and listening to this and you're like, wait, what? Wait, you just, so much of the guidance, and I appreciate the smiles that I'm seeing because Bus guidance has been out for several weeks, and it now indicates that K-12, if mask and the windows are opening, there are no distancing requirements on buses. And you're like, wait, what? But in a classroom, there are requirements. But if it's an athletic bus, it could be different. And so I just want to thank Deanna again, because so much of this seems contradictory that the debate club, it doesn't count, but the biology class, it does count. And so yeah, I get the collective frustration for community listening to the school committee meeting, for school committee members listening to this, that um, again, just my indebtedness to Deanna for keeping up with all of this, with information that oftentimes seems like it's contradicting. 
I think the biggest thing is, is that when we have kids in the school building and they're in their classrooms and they're within three to six feet, we don't want to be saying to them, come to school. We want you at school. Oh no, wait, go home. You need to quarantine. So we want to be able to see if we maintain this three to six foot distance. We watch them as Yes, they're close contacts, but we allow them to come back to school. We want to see it's it's in the science. We're all learning this. We want to make sure that they indeed are safe to come back to school. And in many cases, they will be with the new variants. It's kind of up in the air. So that's why we're still going to track them. We're still going to pay attention. We're still going to be checking in and we'll be doing the best that we can surveying that to see what happens. Yeah, thanks, Deanna. And I think I, I, I agree. I think the science at this point does suggest that that, you know, kind of bus guidance aside that that in the classroom, things are quite safe. And so my hope would be that they get some data on this and then be able to further extend it out to some of those other pieces um, so that, you know, we can really continue to move forward with all of this. Which I think is what they will do because in the writing, it said at this time. So I, I do feel like that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure it out systematically, taking our time to do that. Mm -hmm. I just want to note, um, I've got a hand raised um, from an Annette's iPhone. We don't do public comment in the middle of the meeting, but we do have a public comment at the end, um, or you can reach out by email if, and, um, and if, that's, if that's better. So if you just want to hold up to the end of the meeting, then you can raise your hand again. Sorry about that. Sarah. So this is like, it blows my mind. It's like there's a magical force field if your bus is going to school for learning, but if your bus is going to a school to play a sport, the magical force field has disappeared. Like it just, it blows my mind. But I know you guys don't make the guidance. It just is insanity. Um, I do want to ask Deanna, I know that, you know, kids have to do their va vaccination stuff at the beginning of the school year and give you, you know, updated information. Have you had any sense or our parents reporting and updating those um, health records just to say we, we've also had the COVID vaccine. I'm just wondering if we have a sense of how much of our 16 plus population is vaccinated, especially since coming next week, we're going to be hitting the availability to hit the 12 plus population. And this is going to be pretty life changing for that demographic of our schools. So I do have families that are bringing in that information for me and students that will come in and give me the information, but because it's not a mandated item, we are not yeah. mandating they give us that information. I've also asked all of my staff and all of the nurses at other buildings to ask their staff if they're willing to give that information to them as well, because where it's not mandated, it's kind of like, we can't make them tell us. Yeah. But um, so I would say, I mean, I have 951 students this year at the high school off the top of my head, I maybe know 20 students that have been vaccinated, okay. but I'm sure it's more than that. They just haven't told me and they don't have to because I haven't asked them. Yeah. To. Well, I mean, if people voluntarily want to send that information in, I just think that's so it's so helpful to have that statistic and it's so reassuring to people because I think our percentage in Marblehead from the data I'm seeing is extremely high. Um definitely when you look at the national rate, but even the state in the other, the other rates around us, Marblehead's rate has been really, really high. So my sense is we have quite a few kids um, that have it too. So it was just interesting. I was just interested to see if we, if we have a sense. Um, and then I also wanted to bring up um, just because we've received a lot of emails on it. And I know it was asked that it, it, you know, this concept be discussed by the school committee. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily asking for a discussion or putting anybody on the spot, but we've had some, um, we've had some requests from the public, you know, for information on what mask policies will be next year. Some families, you know, looking for no masks for next year. And I think it's important for people to understand, although we made that policy that came from our guidance is given to us by the state. Um, you know, DESE gives guidance, the State Department of Public Health, see the CDC. So this guidance comes down to us, sometimes as, as, as firm rules, sometimes as guidance. So I, do, I just wanted to put that out there in the public. I think it's unlikely that this decision will just be thrown to school, local school committees to say like, do you wanna make this decision on your own? I think this guidance will come from higher up 
and you know where we may or may not have to make an official policy that's nothing more than like a loophole or not even a loophole just like you know dotting our i's and crossing our t's this guidance will be decided one way or another at a higher pay grade than us is my assumption um but just in respect to the number of times you know we've you know, we've had an individual reach out about this. I thought it would be respectful to at least say, you know, there is some questions about this. It's not that they're being ignored. It's just, I don't see it's going to be in our purview. I think it's going to be a higher pay grade. I would agree. I think it's probably going to be Desi and it's probably going to be Governor Baker. That's my guess. John, did you want to add something to that? Uh, yes. Um, through the chair, the, um, this is a question that's on the superintendent's list serve pretty regularly now that we are back in school and just on the news this morning, there were a couple districts that have voted to maintain their current uh, mask policy. I think it was Arlington and maybe Cohasset. Um, I know our policy subcommittee is meeting on Monday. Uh, that'll be an agenda item because I think that as we have done throughout the pandemic, we take the information that we have, we take the guidance that we have and use it to nuance our local decisions. And so now that the governor has uh, uh, offered new guidance uh, for masks in outdoor settings, I think it is prudent for us to look at our local policy and see if there are uh, some changes that can be made to that. And then as we progress toward fall, but I, I think Sarah Fox is absolutely correct. There is no way that we can offer any sort of a decision for what September will look like as we are just making decisions for what maybe spring sports will look like and graduation. And I will say that Desi has said that graduation has to be a masked event. So I would want us to not jump too far to no masks and then come to graduation and people feel like that was confusing, so. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I think it, it absolutely, you know, the the mask policy will continue to be looked at. Um, I think, you know, probably quite, or you know, relatively frequently, um, in as we move forward, um, and and will, you know, and I, you know, it, it quite frankly wouldn't surprise me if at some point it looks similar to how we brought kids back into schools. It looked one way for one group of kids and another way for another group of kids. Um, so, you know, there's, I agree, Sarah, and, and certainly hope you're right that DESE and the state gives us further guidance and that we're not left to kind of make all of these decisions um, on our own. Um, but I think, you know, it, it, yeah, it's hard to say, you know, what, what it will be, but I do think it's going to be an ongoing piece as we sort of roll forward with all of this. Right. Uh, but I but I would say that, you know, to go along with what Sarah's comments are, we are here tonight and this committee actually does have an option related to mass guidance that is counter to what the current state guidelines and CDC guidelines are. Um, and um, to um, Dr. Bucky's point, I don't think they conflict with uh, with with graduation because the the guidelines that come from the CDC are you know fully vaccinated people no longer need to wear masks outdoors except in certain crowded settings and venues and I think we could certainly say with 250 students graduating and six guests per each student that that becomes a pretty crowded venue and uh, I think it also um, lines up with with what the what the state guidelines are as to um, you know, you know what our governor uh, came out and said. Um, and additionally, I would strongly encourage. I think you know if if we are following the procedure that it's based on policy, um, the Board of Health did post that effective uh, April thirtieth that face coverings will be relaxed in outdoor settings and are only required outside in public when it's not possible to socially distance and at other times by sector specific guidelines. So um, we're here and we still do have a policy where it's masks at all times by all people on school property. And um, I know as a committee, 
you know, with the information that we had in the fall and as information progressed, um, all of our, even what Deanna explained, you know, you know, your, your quarantine used to be 14 days and then it was 10 days. And then, you know, who was the close contact and, you know, when did you go take your second test? And it just, it continues to evolve and we've continued to follow those. And I would strongly recommend that I think as a, as a community and as a state, these guidelines have been put forward and I would recommend that we, we allow some flexibility to, um, you know, start moving in the other direction from when we, when we move down, now we're trying to move away from it. The, as Sarah has mentioned, there's a high vaccination rate in, in Marblehead. We, we assume that there's a high vaccination rate among our staff, but it's not required for people to, um, you know, give us that information. So I, if it's not within the purview of the committee and given that, um, you know, these things are, are ever changing. And I, you know, there, you know, there, there's one other example that I think, you know, is, is reasonable. I mean, not everybody on the 30th, just because the governor declared changed their policies. Um, you know, my employer waited until yesterday and I'm sure there were multiple meetings and reviews to assess how that was going to come about. And I actually think part of it was based on you know, what the city of Cambridge was going to do. And the city of Cambridge also relaxed their face requirements. And many times we've worked hand in hand with the Board of Health. And so we would never, I don't think we'd be hard pressed to go against what the Board of Health would recommend. So in this case, if, if they're relaxing them in outdoor settings, I think um, hopefully we can try and do the same thing, relax the mask requirement in, in outdoor settings for, you know, as an example, if uh, parents are at Eveleth, they're picking up their kids, they want to stay after school on a sunny day like today, and they want their kids to play on the playground. And if there's six adults and they're socially distanced down there, I would like to think that the adults will make a decision based on whether they've been vaccinated or not. And it doesn't mean don't wear a mask. People still have the option to, but I'm not sure that we should be requiring it at this point. So. And I think that all just speaks to, we'll follow the guidance you give it. So I think, um, I, you know, I do have this on our posted agenda for the policy meeting. Um, and I think that's probably the appropriate way to push it through right now. I do. I think it's worth noting. So that'll be Monday that we'll look at it. Um, and then we can, you know, kind of, we're, you know, look at language and everything like that and, and make it clean. Um, and then we do have a meeting next Thursday evening as well. So, you know, best practice for policies is to have them come through three times. So once at the subcommittee level and then twice at the full committee level. But we we did the mask policy in the fall in it at a single meeting. And so, you know, we can move to to adopt a new policy next Thursday as well, if that seems like a good idea, because, you know, otherwise, you know, we are sort of, we're, we're taking next week as well as the week after. Um, and then we're, you know, we're pushed well into May at that point. So, you know, I just, I, I'm going to put that out there right now. And obviously if anybody disagrees and wants more time next week, then, you know, we can, we can do that. Right. Um, but that that is an option to us so that we're not kind of, you know, it doesn't, there's no appearance that we're sort of punting it and punting it and letting it get caught up in, in bureaucracy. Cause I think, you know, it is important. I think, you know, the, and this, this little side debate has, I've heard it sort of in, in the news and everything too, of like, we don't, you know, we don't want to go, we don't want to let our guard down, but we also don't want to keep things too tight so that people feel that the rules are kind of, ridiculous and not, and they don't want to follow them anyways. You know, we want to keep things balanced. Um, and I think, you know, that, right. that certainly would be my priority as we move forward. And I think Dr. Bucky, uh, it, remind me. So if there, if there are youth sports programs taking place, for instance, at village school this weekend, since it is school property, people need to abide by the masking requirements and if there was you know use of the turf field by um you know youth lacrosse adults who are on school property 
uh, abide by that policy as well. So, um, you know, that that's what I'm just saying. I, I'm asking, yeah, so for further review. And I think, once again, it's not saying don't wear them, but if the guidance is saying it can be relaxed and people can can make adult decisions, we're still saying, as we heard from Greg, the athletes are going to be masked. Um, Greg was at the baseball game today telling the students to space out, you know, on the benches, you know, the coaches were saying it and, you know, I'm all for that. And there's MIA guidelines on that. But, you know, if, if there's something I, I would just like to see that we have some further consideration of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Emily, did you want to say something? I just want to make one quick point. I think what Sarah said about finding a balance is exactly how we should go about it and figuring out by, and what we can do is we'll look at all the guidance before we meet and figure out what's going to work best for all, everyone to feel comfortable. And I think that's what's most important yep. is finding the balance. Yep. Great. So, yeah. All right, Tiana, did you have anything else that you wanted to add this evening? All right. Thank you so much for joining us and, and for all that information. And again, you know, thank you for everything that you do. All right, John, anything else under your report? I can't imagine what it would be. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that will move us on to our finance organizational support. Um, Michelle, we've got you on for a monthly financial report, including the COVID expenditures update. Yes. Thank you. Um, so we have our monthly report and actually we ended up, um, because I'm doing it early in the month this time, but I actually skipped last month. So we're skipping the month of March altogether and going right to April, um, because April is only a few days old at this point. So when I was putting the, the figures together, I said, I might as well do through the month of, month of April. So as of the month of April, we have spent a total of $27,642,144 or 68% of the operating budget. We are in the final stretch of the last two months of the school year. Um, while that 68% is not what you think it would be for being 10 months through the school year, we have a large expenditure of our lump sum payrolls in the month of June for any of our teachers that choose to be paid over 26 pays. So I just wanted to mention that for those of you who aren't familiar with our payroll process. Um, no surprises this month, continue to operate to monitor the special education costs. We are still reporting that we are breaking even in that those budget lines. So that's great news. Um, area of substitute teaching costs. We have spent just under $70,000 or 28% of the substitute budget. Um, really that is the differential between the hourly rate when we're paying our paras and tutors and not the additional hours. So our, our true substitute costs when we're using our paraprofessionals or tutors, um, we're using them for additional hours. So a lot of them are, are scheduled for 19 hours or 30 hours. A lot of them are actually working a little bit more. So that, that additional hourly cost is not being captured in this budget. It's actually being charged to the payroll budget, but we did have some um, surplus there. So, um, so it's not really a true cost if you say our total super our total substitute cost is only 28% of that budget. Part of it is increased hours under um, the regular payroll lines. Um, but there are a couple other accounts that I brought up last report. Um, one is the custodial overtime account. We have blown this budget out of the water. Um, to say the least, we are currently in deficit by just over $27,000. Um, anticipating a deficit of approximately 55,000 by the time we get to the end of June. Um, we do have a um, couple of custodians that were out on leave. I believe we are fully staffed except for one vacancy at this point, um, but it does continue to cost us overtime. And now that the kids are actually back in full day, we are incurring a little bit of uh, bus driver overtime um, each day because their days start at 6 a.m. and they're not normally out by 2.30 because the kids are being picked up right about that time. So they're working an extra hour of overtime almost every day, um, the bus drivers. So we will continue to, to incur some, some overtime there, but that's no surprise to us. And we should be fine in terms of covering those costs. Um, another area we're watching is unemployment compensation. 
I do not have any additional information from what I reported last time. Um, we had spent a total of 36,000 and, and that was through November. Um, still waiting on some additional bills there, but I am anticipating a deficit ranging anywhere from 30 to 60,000. But the good news is the unemployment claims are slowing um, and a lot of it was fraudulent activity, but it just, it was a lot of busy, unneeded work. Um, for a lot of different people. So, so that's slowed and that, that's a great thing. Um, also attached a copy of Vita Transfers is a few more, but nothing, nothing of any interest to be honest. Just wanna put that out there. And then finally, we do have our COVID reports. Um, so, so far we have paid a total of, and this is as of April 30th as well, so only a few days ago a total of $1,611,507. We still have encumbered $494,954. Some of this is IT, some of this is um, the, the tents that we still have up at this point. Part of that was fundraised for, about half of the cost was supported with a wonderful donation from parents that went through the boosters and we are so grateful for that. And that donation will actually be on the next school committee um, agenda for you guys to approve. Um, but a portion of the tents are being charged to the COVID funding as well. So um, that's part of the encumbered amount right there. And we have additional estimated funds of 269,664 for a total of um, almost 2.4 million. So that, that, that's quite the figure. Um, I do wanna mention that these figures do not include the next round of funding, which is on our radar screens. It's the ESSER three grant. Um, we have received a preliminary figure of just over $796,000 that we'll be receiving through this grant. Um, we do not expect to receive any of those funds this fiscal year, but the grant application should be coming out within the next month. Um, usually they give you about a month or two to apply for it and figure out what you wanna use it for. Um, and we will do that at the time. I do wanna add that 20% of this grant must be spent for learning loss. Um, so we are certainly looking at um, what we can do and how we can directly impact the students in a very positive manner. We're also looking at summer programs. Um, our one big challenge there is um, trying to find staffing. Our staff is burnt out and trying to attract staff to run our programs is a continual challenge for us at this point. Um, we have great ideas. We now have the funding. We just need the people. Um, but that's something that we continue to explore a little bit. Um, so that's about it, but we do have that, that seventh pot of money with that new grant coming up um, that will be added to my COVID funding once we have a de definitive number and um, a little more information on that grant. Um, but that's about it. There's not, there's not much coming out on that grant these days and I'm not hearing much about the additional funding that the town might be receiving. Um, pretty much has been very quiet in that in that regard um, okay that's about it great john did you want to say something and yeah, Sarah, i the, see your hand through the chair i just want to underscore what um, michelle has said and this is all over the superintendent's list as people are looking at innovative creative summer programs they we are really struggling to find staff to participate because of how challenging the year has been. DESI is offering some um, options, but those come with a pretty uh, prescriptive professional development requirement. And so teachers, paraprofessionals, tutors are just kind of saying enough. I need this summer for me to be ready to come back in September. And so I know Nan and Michelle and I are all working very hard and Eric Oxford about summer programming, but I wanna be very, very honest that finding qualified staff right now is very challenging. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Sarah, go ahead. I do have a few questions. As, as it pertains to the summer, I know you, know you can only do what you can do, but is there, do we have any leverage to further incentivize people for the summer um because you know through the chair uh sarah that i don't think and i've had this conversation with some local superintendents there is a sum of money bringing teachers out this summer that that, that yeah. the incentives and everyone's being as creative as possible but they're just saying i need the summer for me 
Yeah. Well, no, I'm wondering if even beyond just financial, like if there's, I don't know if there's some other ideas, but then that kind of makes my other question absolutely, one of my other questions absolutely, because I know there's some additional summer program grants that have come out very, very recently. The, the original ones, you know, we, we obviously have, you know, separate from COVID, we have some of our summer learning for kids, you know, and I, IEPs. And then, then we had some programs set up for some of our younger learners for literacy, but what's come out recently kind of brought, there's some broad sweeping things you can do with it. So if we can't do those first two buckets, we're not, we're not even looking at that other. Well, that through the chair, at... We are looking at it. And yeah, Nan yeah. actually met with Matt Fox today to talk about yeah. middle school programming, but I, I just, I'm going to say it again. Just, finding yeah. staff is our challenge right now. Yeah. And we can't use student teachers. Um, I think we can certainly. Yeah. Um, and then how long do we have the tents for? Do we know, or I mean, do we have them committed through the end of the school year or, or no? Um, yes, we are. They were initially scheduled to be picked up at the end of next week. Um, Nan has been working to get those extended. I'm not sure if the company has confirmed that, but they, they're usually very good. Um, so we're planning on having them through, I believe, June 11th at this time, with the exception okay. of the large high school tent, which will be kept for um, the senior week activities. Okay. And then can we put a hold on them for the fall in case we need them that we can always cancel, but just so Nan isn't left kind of beg, borrowing and stealing from every tent company in New England yeah, in the, for the fall? Um, we probably can, but we probably have to put a deposit on that if we do. Yeah. Um, but this company has been fabulous to work with and they're on one of our collab collaborative purchasing agreements. So we do not need to go out to bid for them. Um, okay. And they have just been amazing to work with. They're, they're so super attentive to our needs. So I think that if I tell them that most likely we will need them in the fall, they will, you know, Good. unofficially Good. reserve them for us. That, no, that's great. And then you talked about the paras, the 19 to something about 19 to 30 hours. At what point are they like part-time versus full time and get benefits? Like, or is there? That is the 19 hour mark. So if they're regularly scheduled for 19 or less hours, they are not benefit eligible. If they're 20 or more hours, they are considered full-time in terms of benefits. Okay. Um, so that's why we have those two, two earmark uh, spots, you know, either they're working 19 or they're working 30. For the okay. Most part. And then when we talked about outplacements, I know spring is often very heavy with, um, IEP meetings and things like that. Mm -hmm. Have we gotten a sense, or I know we have that tracking list that was set up last year. And at the bottom of it, we have the like possible likelihoods. Um, do we, are we looking at any possible likelihoods that would be, for our next, like, you know, FY22 that we're looking at now that more IEP meetings are happening? Um, I'm not aware of any right now. I haven't touched base with Eric on that or Dr. Oxford on that um, in a few weeks, but there were no surprises um, the last I checked with him a few weeks back. And That's usually if there's a big surprise, he comes running right into my office. So I do not uh -huh. think there's any big surprises. That's good. That's good to know. Um, and just as we go into the vote, I just want to know, um, when I abstain, it's nothing scandalous. None of this stuff was in my Dropbox. I don't know what happened, but none of the documents got uploaded to my Dropbox. So I'll just, I, I didn't get to review any of them. Okay. I think the Dropbox is getting extremely full and we need to start removing some of the documents because I've had that problem in the past. Yeah. And I, I think, think where I'm on building committee too, David's mentioned sometimes like that can be a, a crux too, because we have so many documents from that as well. Right. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely was, Sarah, and I had to go and delete some older building committee things from like 2016. Um, there were a few things that I just downloaded to my hard drive, but um, Lisa has talked with me about that, and Lisa is actually working to archive a lot of those things so that there is a record of them if they're not in Dropbox. So, Sarah, I was able to get to the um, information through Lisa's email or update email that said, you didn't get that? No, it kept bringing me to Dropbox. And I actually went oh, so to the school committee website, too, under documents. I'm like, maybe I can get them there. And I could oh, get them Okay, there. weird. Okay. 
yeah, we've got to get some things figured out with Dropbox because <laughs> every once in a while it does this and then it's fine for a while and then it sort of, you know, goes sideways. So, yeah. Um, all right. Any other questions on the finance stuff? All right. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, we have to do the schedule of bills and that was, <laughs> that's what we've got to vote for. All right. So we do have a schedule. Um, and so I will ask for a motion to approve the identified schedule of bills totaling $3,109,281.57. I David moved. Second. And Emily second. Uh, any questions on any of those? All right, um, so we'll call Sarah Gold, yes. Emily Barron? Yes. Sarah Fox? Same. David Harris, don't forget to unmute. Yes. Thanks, so that passes three to zero to one. Thank you everybody, thanks again, Michelle. All right, so that takes us into school committee communications. Um, first up is the continued discussion around um, who on our committee wants to represent the school committee in the planning for success. Um, I, I don't know. It, Initiative. All right. Initiative. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I know, you know, I know Megan's not here this evening. I know she was very, very interested in it. We've got two um, spots. Um, I know, Sarah, you had said last week that you were very interested in it as well. Um, I do want to follow up on just like one one thing that so I know that we had, you know, John, you said that meeting outside would be an option under the tents, but it sounds like the tents aren't going to be available past June, past mid-June? I think Michelle said June uh, 11th. So does that impact the ability to run things outside and where that leaves Sarah, you know, how Sarah's We feeling? have the portico at Glover we've utilized for things like that too. I can, I can we can figure that out. That's, that's not a deal breaker. We can figure that out. Okay. All right. Um, so, so I think it sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it, but it sounds to me like, um, like um, Megan and Sarah, that you have a real passion to do it. Um, and so, you know, I think, um, John, I guess I had one question just to, you know, just with all the weirdness that has been this year, is there, like, if, you know, we're, we're in an election season as well. And, and, you know, if for whatever reason, outside can't be utilized. Is there sort of an alternate that could come in or would we just lose a position on the committee at that point? Um, just really for informational sake. Um, that's a great question. I can reach out to the planning for success um, facilitator and see what other districts have done. Um, I'm thinking that if somebody started in the effort um, and things changed or somebody needed to step off that having a second school committee member step in. I know David is chomping at the bit to <laughs> jump in on this initiative. So no, but I, I would want to have two school committee reps. And if those needed to change or had to change, um, we would, we would roll with that. Okay. All right. All right. So do, do we want to take a vote on this or are we, because this is a, I think this is structured as a superintendent's advisory, so it wouldn't. It's not a. It's not one of our subcommittees, so we don't need to um, officially take a vote on it unless somebody wants to. I like a vote because just because it says vote, so I I'll make a motion to appoint Sarah Fox and Megan Taylor as the representatives for planning to success initiative. <laughs> All right, David. David said he would second it. Um. Any other? Second. <laughs> All right, Sarah Gold, yes. Emily Barron? Uh, yes. Sarah Fox? Yes. And David Harris? Yes. All right, that passes four to zero. And then obviously, if anything pops up at any point, um, you know, we can revisit it. I'm happy to do it. But if um, things change for David and Emily, I'm also, we, we can have that conversation, so. <laughs> <laughs> One point of clarification I did want is, so we have the parents, we were going to have a certain number of parent reps that we were putting in and people put in applications. When we did it for the super search, we had 
we made sure that we had representatives from the, I think we did pre-K through six group and then the seven through 12 group. So like we, we pulled from two different hats, if you would, just to make sure that both demographics were represented. Can we just make sure that we're make, that we have representation from both demographics again? Absolutely. I think okay. was that on, was that I thought explicit? It was too. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. on there that it would be right, a I certain that. element. I apologize. Okay. All right. Any other questions from anybody on the planning for success initiatives? Do, you, know, you said you had a lot of parents put in applications. Do you have a lot of students? Um, I'm, I wouldn't say a lot of students, but I'm <laughs> heartened by student interest. Uh, the okay. uh, particular student that reached out to me initially, like the next day, was very passionate and provided oh, a really great rationale for wanting to participate. So that, that was oh, gratifying that, for me. That's wonderful. I was thinking if we didn't have anybody, we might be able to put a little bit of pressure on Dan. <laughs> <laughs> well, that actually was going to be my next my next question. Are we are we able to take seniors who are graduating because this is going to be finished, you know, by mid August? I think it was. Um, are we able to? Are, are are is this available to to current seniors? Yes. All right. Great. Great. They All right, and then. Well, damn it. <laughs> Uh, and then we'll meet next week um, to 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 draw those names and and make that all official. All right. Um, next up is the 2021 2022 school year school committee meeting dates. Um, so we had a memo in our Dropbox. That's not the correct memo. Um, and we've it basically kept it at the first and third. Um, Thursdays in, uh, in, the, in the month, um, there was a couple that we were given options on. Um, so Sarah, I don't know if you wanna try to get at this on the website, but um, just so that you can have it in front of you. Um, so the, the September, the first Thursday is, the, is September 2nd, leading the third Thursday to be the 16th. Um, we do have a fifth Thursday so the third Thursday is actually no school for Yom Kippur. So we would, we, we have a couple of options. We could punt to the, the 23rd as our second meeting in September and keep the second, the September 2nd as our first meeting. Or given that that's literally like the second day of school, we could meet on the second and fourth Thursday of the month and for the month of September. Obviously, given that, you know, these are these are all flexible and, and we, we, we add meetings and and, you know, remove meetings at times. The ninth and the 23rd. Is that so, so the ninth and either the second or the ninth and the 23rd? Because I'm going to guess that we don't want only a one. Yeah, I say the 9th and the 23rd. Okay. That would be my vote. Uh, yeah, definitely. Because especially where it's September 2nd, it's like kind of weird because there's actually five Thursdays that month. Right. Um, and then, then I had another thought and it's gone. <laughs> um, David, do you, are you good? I'm good with, I'm good with that. Okay, so we're, we'll move for the 9th and the 23rd for the month of September. October, November, December, January are all first and third. Uh, February, we've got a first and a third. The third Thursday actually does not fall on February vacation. And Lisa has it noted that the budget workshop would be the second week of February that month. I remembered my other thing. Every year there's a conflict between open houses and our school committee meetings. And every year we get feedback. Um, so I don't know which gets planned, the chicken or the egg, but if we can co coordinate that and try to make that not happen again, because I think like three, four years in a row now people have spoken out against that, that it makes it really hard. Um, yeah, I think this past year, the third grade one was on Thursday. 
hit and hit, <laughs> hit all four of us. Sarah's audio okay. just changed on my. And then um, for some reason her audio is. My audio is funky. No, Sarah Gold's audio oh. just sort of became like an Echoly? echo, but yeah, yeah. That's, I can yeah. hear that too. Now it's now, now it's, it's better. better. It's better. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk about our summer retreat dates at some point. <clears throat> Yes. Yeah. Let's um, thank you for bringing that up. I'll, I'll get that out um, either the next meeting or the first one in June. Okay. And or, then sorry, the, the third, the third Thursday of this month or the first Thursday in June. Okay. And then just looking ahead, I know that the last two years were a little funky because one, you know, Bill had just come on and then John had just come on. And if we can kind of start to try to shift back to what a true retreat kind of looked like, Absolutely. Um, I think that behooves us. Yes. Agreed. That was, that was going to be my, my suggestion as well. Okay. Um, I will make one more note. Um, April gets funky for us as well, because the third Thursday in April is actually over April vacation. So do we want to do the first Thursday and then the 28th as an off cycle, or do we want to again, do the second and the, um, fourth for the 14th and the 28th. I think from my thoughts on this one is to keep the seventh because of how budget sometimes gets and then do the 28th. And no, I agree. Obviously we may need another one thrown in there as well. Well, I, I can't, we're, in April, I feel like we always went up in the next year meeting because of the budget. Yep. Um, so I think that works. Yeah. I feel like we've been meeting almost every Thursday for the last three months at this point. So <laughs> I, I'm really looking for a skip a week to be perfectly yep. honest. A um, um, couple weeks, a couple weeks. Um, and then I see the note here about at, potentially looking at a six versus seven. I have to say, I feel oh, yeah. really strongly opposed to that. Um, I think, you know, public meetings, you know, whether it's the planning boards or whatever they are, tend to be at seven as a rule of thumb. The town's used to that. I feel like we've gotten some really great public participation this year because of Zoom and stuff. I'm hoping those people stay tuned in because we're so riveting what happens here. Um, and I think that six o'clock is, it's hard. It's dinner time for people. People are, once we get back to commuting to work, people are commuting. Um, and I think that that six o'clock really is what the threshold of it kills public participation. So I, I, I go ahead, David. Well, I'd like to just say certainly public participation is a consideration, but I think it kills members. Me being a committee member when you work all day and you, we wait, we're just waiting to meet, you know, I'd, I'd prefer actually to start at five o'clock or five 30. I mean, years ago, I think I was, I recommended they, we used to start at seven 30 and back in the day we made a motion and at least rolled it back to seven. And the second piece is I think when we have so much participation from our administrators and our staff, um, maybe there's been a little bit more flexibility because of zoom and they've been able to go home, but I think we've seen most of our administrators are still here working and they're in their offices uh, presenting to us. And so I think when we get back to normal to do it, to expect our, our staff and administrators to come and make presentations at eight and 8.30 at night after they've been in district since seven o'clock is, 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 um, is, is a lot for them. I'm sure some of them will still have to come at eight o'clock even if we start at six. So I think that's just an additional consideration for the, the professional staff that make up so much of our meetings as well. Yeah, yeah, and I agree with that. I think this is a, this is a hard one. I, I'm glad that John put it in there because I think the more we have it out there, you know, I don't want to make a decision on it tonight, I, or I would prefer not to make a decision on it tonight. The committee can absolutely overrule me. Um, but I, you know, I think having this conversation this evening and then looking at it again over the summer, I have a couple little agenda tweaks that I would like to put forward to. And I don't have them sort of, you know, it's been throughout the year that I, you know, go and look at a different right. district and how somebody else is doing it. So I would, I need to go back and actually compile um, and do a little bit more research. But I think this sort of melds well with that, that, you know, that as we look at things over the summer and just sort of, you know, tweaking things, um, you know, as we figure out over the summer, 
what next year is going to look like and what other boards are are starting to do and and how we want to function um, moving forward. Um, you know, I think that there's quite a few different things to that'll sort of start to fall into place and then other decisions that that we can make. Um, so, you know, my preference would be not to make a decision on this um, and and wait. Um, but I am really glad that we had the discussion and, and got it out there as, as an idea that we're considering. Emily, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I agree. I don't think we need to decide right now. I think now that it's been out there, we can kind of get feedback. Um, but I do agree with David and have it. There's so many um, school administrators, teachers, people come and listen now. And when we do return in person, I feel bad if they would have to sit past 9 30 10 i mean we run a three-hour meeting pretty regularly and just out of respect to them i think you know starting earlier gets them home earlier gets us all home earlier <laughs> so but yeah i said everyone can think about it yeah and i think you know as we you know i think some districts are actually moving away from zoom already i'm not really interested in doing that well i would have interest in it but i don't think it's a good idea i can't wait to stop running a couple of meetings at the same time um, but I do think, you know, also doing some work over the summer to coordinate how we're going to continue to give additional access um, and as much access as we possibly can to the public. Um, and that some of that hopefully would help with some of these concerns as well. You know, I think some of the ease of being able to tune in uh, from your computer is great and, and in, you know, increases the amount of information that we can get out to the public. And so how we continue to move that forward. Um, as we continue to move more towards normal, um, that you know, those are those are big conversations and, and things to have as well. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about you know having the meetings up on YouTube that people can not only live stream if they choose to, because um, my understanding is a lot of people aren't doing cable. I mean, I'll. I still have an AOL address, so I'll probably hold on to cable till my dying day. But, um, but um, I, I think if we can find a way to continue to incorporate that, I know there's a lot of rules with using the MHTV tape and posting it as a recording on our site, but people really like, you know, going back and looking in, and it's benefited us all. The more Agreed. people that are tuned in, the better it is for our students at the end of the day. Agreed. I would really, my, my goal is to be able to continue the live, the, um, the live stream YouTube um, is my hope. Yeah. And I think, you know, with the, with the work of Steven and working with MHTV, I think, you know, giving enough time for that. I had had a conversation with MHTV back in the fall about this. And so we kind of figured out how we could do it and which is how we're doing it now. Um, and I think, you know, moving forward, we absolutely can, can, can figure things out. I'm confident in that. All right, so do we want to vote on these dates though? Because I, I think we usually vote on the dates that we have picked out. I'll make a motion sure. to approve the um, school committee meeting dates as presented with the alternate options included. All right, David has made a motion. Can I get a second? Second. All right, Emily has seconded. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, Sarah Gold, yes. Emily Barron? Yes. Sarah Fox? Yes. David Harris? Yes. Great. That passes four to zero. All right. Um, subcommittee and liaison updates. Um, I think we've mentioned a couple of times policy is we did not meet last month um, and policy is going to meet on Monday morning. Um, anybody else? I know Dan um, mentioned the cultural feast next Friday at six, but the food is going to be food trucks, which I think is absolutely amazing. So everyone should come and have their dinner at the food trucks absolutely. and see the performances and it's going to be awesome. So I'm just going to. This is a really great event. I went last year um, and it was really what I think the last thing that happened at the schools before COVID shut everything down and it was fantastic and it was really fun to watch the students and then really fun because it was much more of a potluck at that point. Um, but this year, obviously, for um, many reasons, they're doing the food trucks. And I have to say, we with the school committee got an email um, from one of the students today, just sort of updating us and officially inviting us. And the I didn't recognize one of the food trucks, but Tanach, 
is one of the food trucks. And that place is hands down one of the best tortas in, in the Boston area. Um, so highly recommend. So yeah, that, um, thank you for mentioning that. So um, facilities, maybe, ooh, facilities. So I was going to say, could we get the, that little um, emblem that she had in the, in the uh, email? Can we put that up onto the website as well? It already is. Oh, good put job. Put it up today, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Sarah, sorry. Um, so facilities is Monday. Um, the, it's our, you know, our typical agenda will be prioritizing um, the assessment that came back. Um, and then also I put on there that we're going to, we're going to talk about to what we want to look at a little bit for our future of our facilities as far as sustainability goes, because, um, you know, big advocate, if there's not an action plan with allocated funding, then it's, it's just a wish. So, um, so we'll be looking at that and then we'll have a, something to report back. Wonderful. I'm excited to hear that. Um, anything else? I don't think so. I think that leads us. Did you want to say anything about, are you good? I think you guys have come to consensus. I submitted my self-evaluation to you all and you guys have a timeline for that work. So. Yep, absolutely. John, can you have Lisa actually email me that? Because I think, so she put it in the Dropbox, but it's part of what I can't get to. I think I emailed that. But yesterday. you emailed that it was in Dropbox. Like we got an email from the last thing I saw was that it was in Dropbox. I can forward it to you. Okay. Um, I thought that I had sent it as a Word document as an attachment to an email for right, Sarah to forward out. That. Let me double check that then. Yeah, we'll we'll all double check and make sure that it's that it's to everybody in an email. All right, David. I think that leads us to the building project update, and hopefully your sound is going to work. We troubleshot a little bit on the. Right. Audio. But before I do that, do we want to talk about the uh, the dedication plaque that's that's going in the in the school? Sure, that's part of your update. Yeah. So, um, should I open that up since Sarah can't see it? Sure. Sarah, did you see the dedication plaque? So I I saw it when I was scrolling through. They just uploaded stuff to the district website, so I can I can look at it via the district website if you want now. Okay, great. So um, as part of the punch list, as we're getting closer and closer, the architect uh, is responsible for providing a dedication plaque. The location is um, inside the entryway um, adjacent to the administrative offices. And um, while, the, while the overall design, you know, whether it's gonna be a bronze or, you know, Gene is working to make sure that the aesthetics of the plaque match the design of the school, um, but the content needed to be defined. So um, I, with the help of Todd Bloodgood and, you know, we got a copy of Glover School, figuring since Glover School was the most recent school that opened up. And we essentially, um, you know, emulated what was in the, uh, what was in the Glover School plaque and, um, you know, decided that we would, you know, use, use that as the, as the format for, for the Brown school plaque. And, um, we did add, you know, there was a similar, um, since you have it pulled up there, um, Emily, there was a similar wording at the bottom. We added some verbiage that simply, um, says, um, thank you to the citizens of Marblehead for your generous support of our students today and beyond. And, um, not exactly the same as Glover, but in the same vein, and then recognize the owner's project manager, the architect, and the uh, construction manager. So, All right. Great. Anybody has any questions? And I, we might as well just take a vote. And then Sarah, my thought was that you know we would uh, we would bring it to the building committee in a couple of weeks, and since the school committee has affirmed it, we'll bring it forward to the building committee to make sure everybody's okay with it. Now, when does this go out, like for order, like when does this get ordered in bronze and all that? It's going to be ordered um, after we vote. Okay. Jean, Jean is going, was going to wait until we, we voted it. And then um, he's going to, once again, he'll present the draft uh, back on 
the actual aesthetics of what it looks like, but he needed to know the content that was going to be in it. So there'll be one more opportunity to see the actual design of it. So it sounds like you want a motion to affirm the content, Con content. of the proposed plaque for the Brown School. I think so, yes. Okay. Would you like to make that motion? I would make, like to make that motion to approve the content for the Joseph and Lucretia Brown School plaque. Great. And Emily or Sarah, would you like to, somebody would like to second? <laughs> I'll second it. One, okay, one question I have under administrators, everybody seems to be listed except for Eric Oxford. Um, that's, that's a good, good catch. Let me just look and see, you know, did they do on Glover? I mean, he's weighed in and come to these meetings and oh, help. Uh, he, he absolutely, I, I don't disagree. I, you know, I'm, I th think that I have, have no objections, um, you know, that, um, you know, while Bob wasn't included under the administrators of the Glover School, I, I would be totally in favor of adding Eric Oxford because you're right, Sarah, he's, he's been an integral part since this school has, you know, some eight to 10,000 square feet and it's a critical piece of the educational design. So sure, good catch. So motion will, will include adding Eric Oxford under administrators. I'll make sure to get that to Gene. And his official title that should be on the plaque would be st um, direct st student services, director of student services, director of student services. And he also is, he, uh, he EDD? also has his doctorate. So EDD, 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 which seems, uh, sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. We've got a motion and it's seconded. Um, Sarah Gold, yes. Emily Barron. Yes. Sarah Fox. Yes. And David Harris. Yes. Great. That passes four to zero. All right, David. And now we will try the uh, technology piece of the second technology piece of the meeting. I'll attempt to uh, share my screen here. Uh, so advanced sharing. Is it allowing me to share my screen? Advanced video share. So, and I'm going to let the uh, video speak for itself. It, it's 58 seconds. So here we go. I can, can everybody see that so far, the blue screen? And can we see a full blue screen? Everybody good? Okay, here we go. <laughs> have it and there is bonus points for the first school committee member who can name the composer any guesses I believe that jeopardy was final jeopardy mozart wasn't it mozart <laughs> yes exactly who said it to music david uh, it's a new feature on um on microsoft the the whole microsoft outlook suite you can put photos into a folder and then you click on making it um, a video instead of using PowerPoint. Yeah, I just I just found that like last <laughs> week. And you can when choose. When the music popped up, I was like, whoa. Yeah, you can choose the music and then how long you want the slide to transition, you know, five seconds, seven seconds, put a title into it. And it's, you know, a little bit better than using PowerPoint or something like that. So anyway, awesome. pretty much speaks for itself, you know, awesome. a, lot of, a, a lot of really 
awesome progress and it's uh it's fast it's furious right now um week by week um uh the exciting piece is next monday the landscapers from um exquisite will be on site and so um the weather's cooperating and getting things ready to go and that one photo where you saw the interior skylights that will be the next aha moment when they start to put the interior skylight in that will just flood light into the second floor and, and down to the first floor so very stuff. exciting yeah very exciting thanks thanks for the fun update <laughs> All right, um, that moves us into new business. Any new business? All right, um, correspondence. I don't have any for this evening. And then we've got a second round of public comment. If anyone would like to raise their hand um, and make a public comment. Sandra Callahan, go ahead. Just remember to state your name and address for the record, please. Sandra Callahan, um, 25 Nagas Ave in Marblehead. I just wanted to um, make two comments. I just wanted to thank Sarah Fox for bringing it to the attention. Um, you know, I being a parent that's working nights while well, working the day and still at the office, I have found it very, very helpful to have these meetings on Zoom. Um, I also find it very, very helpful that they're at seven o'clock. Most of the uh, committees do meet at seven. It does, it, it does allow the uh, public to participate. Um, I especially think this year, like I said, I've, it's only allowed me this year to participate, but I think a lot of the protocols that you guys have changed has been in response to public comment. And so I think public comment and public participation in these meetings are very, very valuable um, to school committee. So I would strongly encourage you guys to think of that um, or at least have some movement in regards to times where they're just not always set, you know, as David recommended at five o'clock, maybe there's five o'clock one week or, you know, the second week is at seven because I do think that's very important. Um, the other thing I just wanted to share because um, I do participate in um, the Board of Health meetings, Sarah had asked about what our um, vaccination rate is for our 16 to 19. So I thought I'd share that with you guys because it was a question I asked Andrew Petty. Um, the last Board of Health meeting was on, it was last week. Uh, I think it was on May the 4th. So these were numbers from uh, I'm sorry, April 25th, I mean, April 28th was the last Board of Health meeting. So these were numbers from April 23rd. I was pleasantly surprised because um, I asked him for a breakdown. Our 16 to 19, 82 kids were already fully vaccinated and 261 had already received their first vaccine. So that was two week ago data. So that's very, very reassuring. So I, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. That is great news about the vaccinations. Can I ask Sandra a question really quick? I know yeah, I don't I take it. Know. It's like informational. Um, I know you work in, um, is it, your field is pediatrics? Correct, yep. When you find out what the, the if there are any clinics specifically, now that we're going to be rolling out that 12 to 16, yep. if we could, I don't know if everyone's behind this, but if we, if you could let Sarah know, if we could just, you know, put that information out there too. So it helps them, our, our demographic and our public know, you know, th these clinics are going to be happening for this age group. You know, we're not obviously mandating, but just getting that it's one more way to get the information out to those families. So I don't know if you guys know, but my practice has actually been one of the COVID vaccine sites. Although we're pediatrics, we've been vaccinating the general public since January um, and unfortunately, with the significant decrease in vaccination rate since it, you know, went open on April the 19th, as of two weeks ago, we've started offering uh, walk-in uh, walk appointments. So I have posted on the altar, uh, uh, some of the websites in Marblehead. Um, so we are offering some walk-ins. You do not have to be a patient of ours. Uh, right now, unfortunately, we're only offering the Moderna vaccine um, in hopes of getting the Pfizer. So that is stuff that I have been sharing on the Marblehead public sites when we do offer walk-in clinics to encourage people. Sarah, yeah. I can, I can, thank you, Sandra. Um, and I can absolutely, you know, we can kind of work within the district to see if we can't get some of that information more coordinated because I know my husband who uh, manages independent pharmacies, they've been getting vaccines and actually have had a few go to waste at this point. Um, so as we kind of, you know, as we kind of turn this corner, as again, I think as we open it up to, to hopefully younger and younger kids, um, you know, I think some of that will decrease at points, but um, having that information available so that parents can access it would be great. Yeah, because I think the best way to stabilize, you know, kids' normalcy is 
to provide a vaccine as quickly as possible to everyone that wants one. Yep. All right, um, I don't have any other hands raised at this point. Um, so as noted a couple of times this meeting, um, we will have a meeting next week, an off cycle meeting next Thursday, um, and then our um, regular meeting the Thursday after that. All right, so I will adjourn us at 9.04. Thank you, everyone.